Well, this may, may come as a surprise to you, but I'm not actually a native Ohioan. I was born in the United Kingdom, but I've spent the last 22 years living and working here in the States as a genomic scientist. But before I get into that, I have something that I need to get off my chest. Now, my countryman, Sir Winston Churchill, famously was attributed with, quote, or attributed with the quote that the English and Americans are two nations divided by the same language. And what was it that he meant by that? Well, take, for example, my name, Peter. When I introduce myself to people, I'm often greeted with unusual responses. For example, huh, like the bread. <laughs> that's Peter. My all-time favorite is the, huh, that's a really unusual name, pizza. <laughs> Seriously, who in their right mind would name their child pizza? <laughs> it's Peter. Well, the one language that we all do share in common, regardless of our nationality, is the language of our genome. And our genome represents all of the genetic material or the DNA that we inherit from our parents. One copy from our mum, one copy from our dad. And this genome is made up of a relatively simple alphabet, just four letters that we call bases, which we represent with A, C, G, or T. The challenge with the genome, though, is it's really big. There's over three billion of these letters within our genome. And much like the example I gave you with my name, when we change one of these letters, the genes that these letters encode can have drastically different meanings, and that can lead to disease. And these are the heroes of the story that I want to tell you about. These are kids with rare diseases. And the majority of these diseases have their basis that somewhere in the genome, something has gone wrong. Now, taken together, there's over 7,000 different types of rare disease that we've described to date. And to get that name of rare disease, you have to affect fewer than one in 2,000 individuals. But by no means do I want you to leave here today thinking that rare means insignificant. Taken together, this group of diseases impacts more than 350 million people worldwide. And here in the States, it's estimated that one in 10 of us are impacted by a rare disease. Take, for example, my own family. I have two immediate family members with a rare disease, and I'm going to tell you about one of them. So these are my youngest two daughters, Samantha and Charlotte. And apart from insisting on dressing like Rainbow Cat for our entire European vacation, <laughs> Charlotte was born with a healthy heart. Her sister, Samantha, however, was born with what we call a congenital heart defect. And this is a picture of her in the neonatal intensive care unit here at Riverside Hospital in Columbus when she was first born. My wife and I had to spend a very anxious few days of her, uh, the beginnings of her life, wondering what was wrong with her. And we were fortunate to get a diagnosis very quickly. She has something that's called congenital pulmonary stenosis, which impacts about one in 10,000 kids. And she's actually doing very well with this disease. It's something that we know how to treat and manage. And you can see that I'm really not that worried about, about her in that picture where I'm holding her. Because I'm beaming, because at the time I'm thinking how amazing this photo is going to be for my next TED talk. <laughs> well, for us to find the answer, though, for kids with rare diseases, we have to look at the genome. We have to see where that typo has occurred. And to do that, we use a technology called DNA sequencing, which is basically the way that we use to read that code, the order in which those letters appear in our DNA. The first time we attempted to do this with the human genome was the Human Genome Project, which began in 1990. And it actually took us 15 years to sequence one individual genome. And they estimated the cost was $3 billion. Well, today, there's new technology that allows us to sequence a genome much faster. And this is an example of one of the next generation sequencing instruments that we have in my lab that allows us to sequence 48 human genomes in just two days. And the cost per genome is around $2,000 a genome. And how this technology works is it by taking all of that DNA and chopping it into really small fragments of about 300 of those letters, and then performing those sequencing reactions in parallel. And we can do this in 10 billion parallel sequencing reactions on the surface of a glass slide. Now, the challenge is with the analysis of this data. Because we've chopped the genome up into small pieces, it's much like taking the entire contents of a library and running it through a shredder. But what we have to do is we have to take this shredded material that comes out of the sequencer and assemble it back together so that it looks like our genome. 
And this is what our genome were to look like should we print it out. This is housed in the Wellcome Trust collection in London. It's over 110 volumes, each filled with thousands and thousands of pages, just filled with these characters, A, C, G, and T. But when we're doing the analysis for a kid with a rare disease, we're not just trying to reassemble it, we're trying to reassemble it and find a typo. And in this case, in the center of this page, a C has changed to a T. And with rare diseases, that's often all it takes to cause that disease. So when we first started to do this analysis, it was taking over two weeks using a supercomputer like this. But my group soon ran into a significant problem, because all we had was this. And if you look carefully, there is a trash can and a bucket and a mop in the corner there, because we shared our server room space with the janitor's closet. <laughs> So what we had to do, we had to, unfortunately, I was denied in my request to get a $20 million supercomputer. So we had to come up with a new way of doing the analysis. And what we did, we came up with an algorithm that very efficiently processed that, piecing that puzzle back together. And this allowed us to take the analysis time down from two weeks to two, uh, under two hours using that computer that I just showed you. And because I invented the algorithm, I got to name it after my hero, Winston Churchill. As you're probably guessing by now, I'm a fan of his. He has absolutely nothing to do with genomics. It doesn't fit whatsoever. <laughs> but now we have incredible technology to sequence a genome rapidly and incredible technology to analyze it. How are we using this for kids with rare diseases? Well, I've been very fortunate over the last five years to lead a program at Nationwide Children's Hospital working with kids with rare diseases to try to use this technology to see if we can identify what's gone wrong in their genome. And while we've enrolled over 100 families into this study, I only have time today to tell you about two of them. One of the things that kids with rare diseases have in common is that up until now, it's taken on average eight years to receive a diagnosis. And that was the case for Lillian Adams' family. For this family, they had been on what we call a diagnostic odyssey. Their journey was a diagnostic odyssey. And by that, what I mean is that when these kids were born, they were identified as having like, low muscle tone. And as they developed, they started to suffer from seizures that couldn't be treated with regular medications. They had severe developmental delays and a host of other issues. And for this family, they went from specialist to specialist, having test after test, trying to identify what was causing their disease. And the result was, in the end, was no diagnosis. And this is an all too common story for families of kids with rare disease, because they're very difficult to diagnose, because you have to work out exactly where it is in the genome that things, where things, something has gone wrong. Well, for this family, we enrolled them into our study. And five days after completing the whole genome sequencing, we found out what was wrong. Both of the children had inherited one copy of a gene with a typo from dad, and one copy of the same gene with a typo from mum. And when you bring these two typos together, it causes a disease called pontocerebellar hyperplasia. Now, for the clinicians, teaching, um, for the clinicians uh, caring for these patients, having this diagnosis is critical in how best to treat and manage them. For our genetic counselors, having a diagnosis means they can counsel the family on their reproductive risks and what risks there may be for other members in the family. But the most important thing here was for mum and dad. Imagine 15 years of tests and not knowing what's wrong. Receiving that diagnosis is life-changing for parents because it puts an end to their search. And I know in my own story with, of facing tragedy and hardship, having someone come alongside me and say, this is not how things were meant to be, or most impactfully to say, you are not alone, has had the biggest impact on me in my recovery from that. And it's the same way with families with rare disease. Once they have that diagnosis, they're no longer alone. In the case of Lillian Adams' family, I was able to just do a quick search online and find two blogs from families sharing their stories with their kids with this disease and find that there are support groups around this disease that this family can then join. The second story I want to tell you about is Emily's story, because Emily exemplifies why it's so important that we are able to do this sequencing rapidly. Emily showed up at the emergency room at Children's when she was three days old, and she was seriously ill. Her blood pH was dangerously low, and she went into a coma. What we found in doing the whole genome sequencing on her was that she had a disease that's known as an inborn error of metabolism. She was unable to metabolize an essential, um, an essential amino acid derivative called carnitine. 
And for kids with this disease, the outcome is devastating unless they are treated. For Emily, the treatment was simple. It was just replacing the missing metabolite. And then for kids with this disease, they can live a normal and happy life as long as they're diagnosed quickly. So where do I see this technology going? What are the next steps that I hope to see with this technology? Well, like I just said, in Emily's case, early diagnosis is critical for early intervention for many kids with rare diseases. And what we're going to be doing in my hospital starting in January is a new program working with kids in our neonatal intensive care unit. What we want to do is perform rapid whole genome sequencing on them and return results back to the clinician in 48 hours. And I have to give a shout out to my team in the Institute for Genomic Medicine because we did our first practice run of this just last weekend. And we were able to return the results back in 24 hours, stunning the clinicians that were caring for the child that we were looking, looking at. But my hope for the future is in novel therapies for these diseases. Right now, 95% of rare diseases have no, no, no FDA-approved treatment. But that's changing with therapies such as gene therapy, which is a new technology that allows us to replace that gene with the typo with a healthy copy of the gene. And that's happening right here today, here in Columbus. This is a picture of Jerry Mendel at Nationwide Children's Hospital, who spent his career studying a group of diseases called muscular dystrophies. Him and his team developed a new, a new therapy for a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is a devastating disease that kids with it will lose the ability to walk, move, and eventually breathe, dying at anywhere between six months to one year of age. Dancing in front of Jerry is a little girl with spinal muscular atrophy called Evelyn. She's the, she's the oldest known survivor of this disease. She's nearly four. She received this treatment, and she's now able to live a relatively normal life. So my hope is that for these kids, that they will receive a diagnosis, not after eight years, but within days, hope, hopefully while they're still in the hospital when they're first born, and that one day, We'll have a novel therapy for all of these diseases. Thank you.